Hello and welcome to Inside Intercom. I'm Liam Geraghty. Today we are talking to a legend of marketing and customer service research, Len Berry. He is a distinguished professor of marketing at Texas A&M University and a senior fellow at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And um, Berry is a past president of the American Marketing Association and has written 10 books in all, including Discovering the Soul of Service, Delivering Quality Service, and the book we're going to focus on today, On Great Service, A Framework for Action. Len, you're very welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. It's my pleasure. You bet. On Great Service has been the go-to book for so many CS folks over the years because of the insights and the framework it shares. And there's a line in the opening chapter that says, great service is rare, but it is not an impossible dream. And um, I love that. What was the inspiration behind writing this book in the first place? Yes. So each of the books that I write, Liam, I, I, I have a goal for it. Um, it it's just like, uh, offering any new product, you, you you need a market, you need a reason for being. You, you uh, it has to have a, a specific purpose. And in that particular book, on great service, my my purpose was to write about service quality implementation. Implementation, because there was so much at that point in time so much talk about the importance of quality service, but companies were struggling to actually implement it, actually make it happen, to go mm -hmm. beyond the rhetoric of, of, of quality uh, and, and service. And so that book was a study of, of 10 different organizations in, in the United States, all in different industries, different sizes, some private, some public, that had demonstrated over time the ability to actually dramatically improve its quality uh, of service. And so that was the purpose of, of the book. How, how do you make it happen? Do you think much has changed in between then? You kind of, you know, mentioned about th then, you know, how to make that happen. But I, I suppose these are still the kinds of problems and challenges that businesses are, are still facing today. Yes, very much so. Um, some of the challenges actually are different today, but they're still uh, imposing great barriers to in improvement. For example, today, we, when it comes to improving service, we have much better technology than we did when I first wrote that book. I mean, we can do marvelous things with technology that we never dreamed about when I wrote on great, great service. And in fact, the, the uh, advances that we've made in technology have changed our expectations as consumers. And so our expectations are actually higher, uh, particularly in terms of convenience and reliability, because technology is supposed to be reliable. Your automatic teller machine is supposed to work. Netflix, Netflix is supposed to always work. Uh, and have the, the movie or the television show we want to watch that they advertise available. And so it's changed our expectations for reliability, the advances in technology, but it's also changed our expectations for convenience. What used to be fast is now slow. And convenience is really a key pillar of service quality today. Um, consumers, as, as a group, do not want to waste their time receiving service. Their time is, is, is more valuable than, than ever. And, and, and so convenience is a primary component of service quality today, today. So the challenges are still there, but some of the uh, barriers and realities and opportunities that existed in, in, in uh, the time I wrote on great service are quite different today. Something that I find interesting about the book is that you, you mentioned a variety of companies, you know, all known for delivering exceptional service and um, Mary Kay Cosmetics and Longo Toyota. And um, how do these like really diverse businesses manage to consistently provide great service despite their differences in industry or offerings? 
Yes. So they 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 do a number of things that are critical to quality service performance well as, as a group and 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 those things are what I wrote about in the, that, that particular book. Uh, these companies, for example, hire well. They hire well. They hire the person, not just the resume. And that I, that probably bears some explanation. Hire the person, not the resume. And what I mean is, someone may have a good resume, a good background, good experience, but they don't have the right customer serving values. They don't really care about uh, the customer. They, their motives might be, how do I make the most money? You know, how do I get the fastest promotion? Their motives might be quite different than how do I make life better for the customers in the business that I'm uh, applying to, uh, to work for. And so hiring for values, not just talent, hiring the person and not just the resume is something that I found in in not just this book, but the other books I've written about ex successful companies and organizations is, is they really do invest in the first rule of executing excellent service. And the first rule of executing excellent service is hire the right people. So that's, that's one thing, Liam. And, they, and these companies also uh, invest in not just hiring the right people, but preparing them to perform well, preparing them to be successful, giving them the confidence uh, that, that they need to perform the service, because without the confidence, it's hard to be motivated. We often don't make in business the connection between um, employee self-confidence and employee motivation. But if you think about it this way, uh, how motivated am I going to be to do something I don't feel confident in doing? I think that's something that would apply to everybody that's viewing this podcast today. We could all relate to that, you know? So the more confident we are in doing something, the more motivated we're going to be in general in, in, in doing it. And certainly the more able we're going to be uh, in, in, in doing it well. So uh, investing in the preparation as well as hiring well, but also preparing well, and then making a commitment that the customer is the business, that unless we do a great job with the customer, we don't really have a long-term business. You know, it, it will diminish over, over time because of our continued disappointing our customers and not meeting their expectations. So making a commitment that the customer is central to what we do, the customer defines um, the kinds of resource allocations we're going to make, and and uh, committing to committing to embracing the idea we're going to meet and better yet exceed customer expectations every time we interact with and encounter customers who need our service, and so that's a key. And you know, I found that and in uh, I found that in all the companies that I studied for that and I've since done other books with other samples of, of, of companies and and, uh, and then my last book was on the Mayo Clinic so it's just one organization actually not a company a nonprofit or health health system but they all really have these these uh, these factors in common and then I'll mention uh, just two more things um, and uh, let you move on to your next question. Uh, I, I found that in running through all of the companies I've studied over many years that have been truly successful, I have found uh, their embrace of the concept of respect, respectfulness, respectfulness to their customers, respectfulness to their employees, respectfulness to all their stakeholders. The, the, the power of respect is underestimated. It's such a basic concept. We, it, and it seems so simple that we, you know, we don't remember to bring it up when we're teaching a business school or doing a, a meeting in our company. Just the basic fundamental 
concept of respect that hopefully we learn when we were growing up as kids that we need to respect others. And so what does respect mean? Let me just take a moment and, and tell you what respect means. It means respecting people's presence. So if they come into your store, uh, they come into your store or they, they call you uh, online, they call you on the, on the phone or they interact with you online, they are present. They're asking for help. There's a reason they've come into your store. There's a reason they've called you uh, on the telephone. Respecting their presence by responding to it. Respecting their voice by actually listening. By listening, not pretending to listen, but actually listening to what the customer has to say. Respecting their time, which I mentioned, by not needlessly wasting it. Respecting their privacy, which is a big issue today, as you know especially with all the technology changes we've seen, uh, and respecting customers' ex, uh, self-esteem. Uh, that's their self-esteem. You know, if you're serving a customer and you roll your eyes when the customer's making requests, that's the opposite of respecting the customer's self-esteem. So these are basic concepts that hopefully we learned as kids, uh, but they're central to delivering quality service. A disrespectful service is a bad service. And finally, and I've already mentioned this, saving customers time and, and effort. Uh, when I, rem I remember in Longo Toyota, how quick they were to take care of customers who came in, bring their cars in for repair. They, were, they had invested in rent uh, in uh, cars that, uh, uh, customer could drive away, you know, while their car was in the shop, uh, cars that, uh, that the uh, dealership would loan to, to customers. They just had a very good system for getting customers who were maybe on their way to work or had to drop off their car in and out of that dealership in about, you know, typically five, 10 minutes instead of two hours. And that's just one piece of their ongoing success. They're still hugely successful dealership in Southern California. Uh, yeah, but, but I, I, I found, I found all of these points that I've just made, uh, paramount in the companies I've studied. The concept of great service seems to go beyond like traditional definitions of customer satisfaction. I'm wondering if you could explain the distinction and significance, I suppose, of great service versus merely good service. You know, what are some of the kind of key characteristics that set them apart? Yeah, good question. So good service is service that meets the customer's expectations. It's, it's fine. It's okay. You've done what you are supposed to have done. You delivered my mail today. Um, uh, that's good service. You've met my expectations. Great service offers the element of pleasant surprise. It offers the wow factor. It exceeds my expectations. It's something that happens that makes me say, wow, they're good. They really care. This, is, this was wonderful. And we use words internally or with others, you know, word of mouth, to describe these kinds of service interactions, these kinds of service experiences, when there's the element of pleasant surprise. So that's, that's really the difference, is good service is, is service that's reliable. Great service is service that's reliable and then goes beyond reliability to, uh, to exceed the customer's expectations, to generate uh, unusual grace, respect, kindness, civility, extra effort. Great service does that. And it does that on an ongoing basis and a company then generates this reputation for truly being uh, a superior company, a great company. And in on great service, you outline a, a really comprehensive framework and um, for implementing great service that, you know, it's, it's still so useful um, 
to businesses today. I was wondering if you could maybe even briefly summarize the key components of that framework and um, you know, how they work together to create that culture of exceptional service within a business. Yes. So in this book, uh, the, the, the core question was, how do great service companies become great? How do they actually move from the, an interest, a commitment to improving their service to, to, to doing it? And so the book, as I've, as I've mentioned, is on implementation. How do you implement uh, great service? And like anything else uh, in organizational change, it starts with leadership. It starts with leadership and and one of the keys in all but the smallest of organizations to great leadership is great leadership in the middle of the organization, the so-called middle manager. In fact, I prefer uh, the phrase middle leaders because that's what needs to happen in an organization with 500 people, 1,000 people, 500,000 people is virtually everybody works for so-called middle managers. And that's where you need great leadership, great service leadership. It is coaching and mentoring and inspiring and role modeling uh, service quality, service quality behaviors. That's rewarding it, that's celebrating it, that's insisting on it. And so uh, nurturing service leadership, it all starts with that, both at the top, but, but very importantly in the middle, and then another piece of my framework is the importance of, of building a, a service quality listening system, an information system, because improving service quality requires knowing what to improve, knowing where to allocate resources to improve your service. And so building a listening system that guides resource allocations uh, that guides service quality improvement decision making is, is central. So that too is part of the framework. And then all, all companies, all organizations need a, a strategy, a, a, a core strategy around which to build, you know, the, the offering, the business. Uh, you, your, your reason for being revolves around, you know, what you offer and, and ser service companies need to offer something that provides value, real value, demonstrable value uh, to their target uh, market. And in this part of the book that's entitled create a great service strategy, there's, there's four key points. One is a service needs to be reliable which I discussed, it, it needs to be consistent. It needs to be dependable. Second, there needs to be this element of service surprise, which I've discussed uh, in order to exceed customer expectations. Third, companies need to be prepared to recover when the service fails. Because even in the best of companies, mistakes happen, failures occur. So companies need to be able to recover and and uh, and what that means the reason we call service recovery service recovery it means recovering the customer's confidence recovering the, uh, his customer's confidence and then uh, last but not least in the create a service strategy the strategy has to be fair it has to be fair it has to be fair as perceived by stakeholders, particularly by the customer. So service reliability, service surprise, service recovery, service failure, those are the four component parts of creating a service strategy. You want your service to be all of those things. Reliable, with a wow factor, uh, with a recovery component when you do fail, and perceived as fair, as fair. And then uh, that's really the front part of the framework. And then 
implementing that framework requires uh, three different component ideas. One is organizing in the right way, structuring the organization the right way to implement that strategy. Another is having the right technology to implement that strategy. And we've talked about technology in general. And then the third, which we've also talked about in general, is having the right people to implement that strategy. So you need the right leadership. You need a listening system so you know what customers truly value and where the gaps are in the model, where the op- uh, in the market, where the opportunities are in the market, where you need to invest most to improve the most. Then you need a service strategy that has these components I've mentioned, reliability, surprise, recovery, and fairness. And then all of that needs to be implemented through structure, uh, through technology, and through people. That's what the, the whole book is about that. Liam, what I do when I write a book is I draw a picture in the first chapter of the book. And um, yeah, and then each chapter takes a piece of that picture and develops it. But I, I feel if I can't draw a picture of what the book is about to begin with, a framework, a model, a, an image to uh, a roadmap to show the readers, okay, here's here are the key points we're going to make in the book. And each chapter is going to take one of these key points and develop it. Then I'm not ready to write the book. So uh, on page uh, five of On Great Service, there's this exhibit. It's called A Framework for Great Service. <laughs> Um, I love that. And also good advice for, for anyone writing a book as well. Um, you know, just you, you, like you said, we did discuss, um, tech at the start of this and, um, you know, it, it, techn- the role of technology, I suppose, in implementing the service strategy. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on AI and, you know, its impact on customer service and, you know, how business can leverage it for that efficiency that you kind of spoke about while maintaining the personal touch that's so often associated with great service. Yeah. Well, I think the good question again, and I think the issue with AI, and there are many people that know far more about it than I, we're all kind of learning about AI at the same time. Um, And uh, learning it in a combination state of awe and a state of fear. (laughs) And, you know, uh, what could this mean in in a good way? And what could this mean in in a bad way? And um, so I, I think the the main uh, concept for all of us as AI progresses and becomes a bigger and bigger part of our lives in business and in general is that excellence, uh, organizational excellence requires a combination of high touch and high tech that no matter how good we get at high tech, no matter how much more advancement we make, and there's a lot more advancement ahead of us, I'm sure there always will be with tech. The touch component is just as important in many services uh, and to some extent in all services. We, we, We need to be able to interact even if we're heavy technology users in our consumer role. We need to be able to react with people when we need people. And there's certain things, even with the AI, there's certain things that people will be able to do better than AI alone. And in part, in some cases, they'll be able to do better because of AI, using AI as a tool, not as the answer, but as a tool just like other technologies are tools. And so thinking, going into the future, thinking about we need to be great if we're gonna be great as an organization, great in tech, 
but we also always need to be great in touch with our people. Um, that AI doesn't diminish the role of people and may change the role of people in delivering certain services, but it doesn't diminish their role. It might change their role, but it doesn't diminish their role. Len, thank you so much for joining me today. I really enjoyed our conversation. You are most welcome. My pleasure. Anytime. <laughs>